Yeah, I hope things work well. So those on YouTube, perhaps uh, the one or the other could, could write a small comment that things are okay. Good, yeah. Jo, thank you very much. I guess we can start. First, um, an, an, an announcement. Namely, uh, next week there's the public climate school. And therefore, I decided to change the program a little bit for our lecture. And this means that uh, next time I will present some material that I presented on German last, or actually earlier this year in a, in a Saturday lecture, namely on the physics of the climate effect. And I worked it out in such a way that I think it's comprehensible for the general public, at least if the general public is willing to, to do a little bit of math. I learned actually that this uh, is not the case for at least, well, 75% of the people. But anyway, uh, I'll try to give this lecture on how the, um, on a simple model of the greenhouse effect. Um, I think it's a, it's a fun piece of physics to do, and uh, I think it's particularly suitable for, for next week. So this is the public climate school. Um, here I have um, their, their announcement. I'm a little bit surprised on the topics they want to discuss. They do it, of course, um, also digitally. And you see all the kind of topics that they, that they cover. And uh, only very few have to do with, with physics or with the climate problem in a, in a, uh, in a, in a smaller sense. Yeah, so if you look uh, at this, what uh, their topics are, then I ask myself, whether um, yeah, all the, um, the political goals that all the parties have in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany and in the world, that they are now, um, that they are now subject to, to the climate discussion. Uh, I don't think that this is very helpful. But anyway, yeah, so we'll do uh, the, the hard thing, um, namely, namely the physics of the warming of the Earth. So this will be the topic of next time. And therefore, um, this week I will start with chapter three, but of course we'll do some, um, some repetitions or um, a, a brief uh, review of what we did last time. So we discussed the structure of national energy economics. And one of the things that we started uh, was actually that we were looking at what's called the energy sectors. And we discussed four of them. Yeah, so there are basically four of them. Um, there's industry, there is private homes, there is traffic, and there is commerce and services in German. It is um, Gewerbehandel and Dienstleistungen. And each of them, um, from the energy footprint is approximately 25%. Some a little bit more, some a little bit less. So commerce and, and services um, actually considerably less. And uh, each of these sectors um, are in general quite, quite different. For example, for traffic, most of the fuels they use is of course oil, mineral oil. For private homes, it's nowadays, well, one half, perhaps a little bit less than one half, uh, mineral oil and the other natural gas. And the reason is quite simple. The reason is that this kind of primary energy or secondary energy or end energy is used for heating homes. We discussed last time that about 80% um, or so of the primary energy consumption of private homes is used to produce hot airs, uh, hot air in order to 
uh, phrase it a little bit polemically. And similarly, uh, the other two sectors, namely industry and um, commerce and, and services. Um, we also had a few slides on, um, on the efficiency, on how this evolved, how, on how efficiency evolved over time. And um, here, is, uh, here is one example. Here is one example, namely the, um, so the final energy consumption um, as, and you see that this blue curve here goes, uh, goes down over time, not dramatically, right? Yeah, so the efficiency goes, um, yeah, so the uh, end energy consumption goes down while the, the size of, uh, of our apartments and homes goes up. So, uh, which indicates that the efficiency goes up. Yeah? But unfortunately, um, yeah, so this increase in efficiency is not used for, for saving energy, but for living more comfortably. Yeah? And um, this is named after William Chevens. Uh, William Chevens um, was an English philosopher um, and so on. Um, and um, he kind of discovered that in 19th century Great Britain or England or rather, um, the efficiency of the steam engines increased and everybody thought that uh, this would lead to a reduction in coal consumption, but the contrary was true. Yeah? And uh, the reason is quite, uh, quite obvious. I have more of these uh, examples. So, um, yeah, so you see um, again here uh, the um, final energy consumption and, uh, and the product productivity. And, um, and here you see a similar thing, namely, um, well, actually for, um, for, for transportation, uh, the end energy consumption did go down um, a little bit. Yeah? So this is, um, this is the Chevens effect or the rebound effect. And one can, um, one can differentiate between different, uh, between different um, effects that can take uh, place if you increase the efficiency. Right? So there can be direct effects. Uh, maybe we just uh, write this up a little bit. Yeah? So uh, the rebound effect. So this is, uh, would be um, number six in this chapter 1.3. Um, chapter six. Ah, oh, yeah, so just because I see it here. So this graph here showing, um, showing the houses, so the age of the houses. Yeah? So uh, this is an important thing. Uh, if people believe that you can save a lot of energy in heating homes by pushing uh, the homes and also buildings like this one here um, to the state of the technology, then um, unfortunately this is wrong because uh, there are so many, uh, so many old houses and only, well, a few percent, perhaps 10, 12 percent. Yeah, so if we look at, uh, so um, I would think that between, so from 2008 um, to, yeah, so this is this thing here, uh, from 2008 to 2000, uh, and 2012, this is this thing here, um, they have a decent um, energy standard, yeah? and all the rest yeah, needs to be needs to be upgraded in principle. Okay, but uh, back to the rebound effect. So we have the rebound effect. Yeah, and there can be direct effects as I described, and we started to discuss this last time actually. Yeah? So um, if you have a more efficient device, then um, uh, more people might want to, to buy it uh, for this or, or other reasons. Yeah? So um, 
um, yeah, so increased demand. Um, due to lower costs. And then there may be indirect effects. And this is the following. So you save money on, uh, on a more efficient device. Yeah? So you buy, you get a cheaper car that is actually better than the old one, ideally, right? And therefore, you have a few thousand euros per year more, um, and you use it for, for traveling overseas. And uh, this is, of course, also something that uh, would increase your footprint, maybe even more uh, than the situation before. Yeah, so the, uh, the cheaper or the more efficient primary product um, frees resources um, for, for new ways of consumption. And finally, uh, there may be macroeconomic effects. So if you have a product that changes the entire economy in the country, say like the internet, and um, at first glance you would think, well, this will save a lot of travel and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, mail uh, doesn't need to be transported by, by, by traditional mail services and so, and so on and so forth. But then you discover that this leads to a huge growth of the economy and in the end even more is, um, is spent than, than before. Well, I don't say that this is necessarily bad, yeah, so I, I have um, yeah, so I um, just report this. Uh, there is no judgment uh, in this um, in this statement. Yeah, so a new product, a new product or or service may uh, transform the entire economy. And usually, it will transform it in the direction of more consumption. Hmm? And um, so, uh, you see that, yeah, so that the market forces, um, they need to be controlled, yeah? on, at, at least on this uh, scale. So the market forces, they are very efficient on the, um, on the, on the microeconomy. Uh, efficient uh, like uh, no other uh, mechanism that has been in, uh, invented, but uh, the market is, has no intelligence. Yeah? And uh, their famous example um, of, um, um, of, um, of feedback, of positive feedback uh, that uh, leads to bubbles, um, and there are examples uh, that go, uh, go back uh, many hundred years. So, for example, the tulip bubble. Do you know the tulip bubble? Yeah. yeah? No. So the tulips. Yeah. So these flowers. They um, they were very uh, very high in demand. Uh, I think 300 years ago or something like that, right? And people bought them like like crazy, and they had an enormous price. Yeah. And uh, of course. Um, yeah, uh, this bubble at some point collapsed and um, created uh, quite, some, quite some crisis at that time. Yeah, and uh, many people got rich with, uh, with selling uh, tulips in the beginning, 
But when the bubble collapsed, um, a lot of them suffered, of course, also. Next point, um, another way to, to depict um, the, the energy economy, these are the Sankey diagrams. And uh, you know them probably or certainly, but perhaps not under this name. Yeah, so Sankey, this was, an, um, this was an Irish engineer, and he was the first to depict the flow of mass and energy in a steam engine in, um, in this way um, that is probably very familiar to you. Right? So what you see here um, are, uh, is the entire energy flow. Yeah? And it's interesting that in Germany, well, about yeah, almost 80% or so of the primary energy are imported. Oops. Uh, and the rest is uh, produced uh, domestically. And then here on the other end, you see um, the four sectors that we discussed. Industry, traffic, private homes, and uh, commerce and services. Yeah? And in between, yeah, so between uh, the primary energy and the final energy, you see all the losses and so on and so forth. Also export, right? And uh, you see how, how big are these losses? Why are these losses so big? Has anybody an idea? Where are most of the losses produced? Yep. Yeah, so, um, sure, yeah, but most of the losses, they actually come, uh, they are actually produced in the power plants due to the Cano, um, due to the limited Cano efficiency. Of course, also in the cables, yeah, so they transport uh, uh, the electricity um, from um, where they are produced to, the, uh, to our homes uh, and so on and so forth. So the question is, what is non-energetic use, non-energetic consumption? For example, um, our food. Yeah? That would be non-energetic consumption. Things like that. Yeah? OK, so these are the Sankey diagrams. Um, I uh, probably don't write anything um, towards that. The most, uh, so just as an interesting note, uh, the most famous Sankey dia diagram was actually, was actually produced before Sankey uh, actually did his diagram. Yeah? So it, the Sankey diagrams were invented before uh, Sankey um, invented them. Um, and uh, they are actually, uh, they are actually, so what you see here is a, is a diagram by a famous French engineer, Minard, and uh, he depicted uh, the Napoleon um, campaign to, to Moscow. Yeah, and what you see is, uh, is the war in all its cruelty. Yeah, so you see uh, how the, the French army and their allies went east, finally, and yeah, so the army gets smaller and smaller, right? And finally arrived in Moscow, and then the black curve is how they got back, right? And uh, you see all the catastrophes underway. And uh, actually what you also see are the temperatures here. Yeah, so the temperatures, um, and they are given uh, in an in a old temperature scale. Uh, where is it actually? Yeah, so here minus 11 degrees Remur, right? So approximately degrees Celsius, not much different actually. Yeah, so that's also um, a flow diagram, and people say so. Uh, people say that it's that it's perhaps the most informative graph that has ever been made. It was made by an engineer who was already in his retirement age. 
but probably as a young man um, experienced or knew about, yeah, certainly, yeah, as a young man, he, um, he, uh, yeah, he knew from first hand about this war. Okay, so um, the final thing uh, to do here in, uh, in this chapter would be to, um, to discuss a little bit, um, to categorize or to do a little bit of taxonomy of the renewable energies. Um, and perhaps I start with a, with a diagram that I found in some book. Yeah. So what you see here, um, what you see here are all kinds of, um, um, of, of renewable energies, right? Unfortunately, in, in German, um, yeah, so uh, let's just name a few. So what you have here is a, a geothermal a power plant. Then uh, this one would use just um, uh, uh, geothermal energy for heating. Yeah, and uh, then you have a, a solar cell, a thermal uh, solar collector. Um, on the other hand, you could use uh, the, uh, the heat from, uh, from water. You could use heat pumps and so on and so forth, water power plants, wind energy, and so on and so forth. And uh, in the end, you see tight, um, so there the tidal waves are used. Yeah? And if you think about where the energy comes from, then uh, you end up at three, well, I wouldn't say major energy uh, sources, but it's three energy sources. Only one is major, namely solar energy. Right? And the heat that comes from the, uh, from the earth, from the uh, inside of the earth, this is nuclear power. Yeah? This is thorium that de uh, decays. Um, so this is um, yeah, so this is uh, only a very small fraction of what comes from the sun, um, and then uh, we also have um, um, energy due to due to gravitation of the planets. Yeah, so the tidal waves. Um, if we look at um, at those forms that are of um, of significance, then it's wind. It is, of course, direct solar radiation that can either be used for producing electricity or directly heat. And um, there is um, bioenergy yeah, by um, photosynthesis. Um, each of these three have the potential to cover the world energy demand. Well, of course, for biofuel, uh, there is uh, always the competition with food. Uh, and this is a quite complex thing to discuss, um, so we wouldn't do that. Uh, what we'll do actually here is to concentrate on wind power. Um, and do also a few, um, a few uh, side remarks. As I said, uh, solar cells uh, I discussed during the summer term. So now I see um, a question here on, um, on the chat. So fossil motors in transport vehicles are on, uh, also only have an efficiency of less than 50%. So a lot of energy losses should also come from there. Uh, that's in principle true. But um, let's go back to, to what we had here. Yeah? So um, what you find here is, is end energy. And what you discuss, Justus, is now the difference between useful energy and end energy. Yeah? So this efficiency is not part. Uh, yeah? So this would be something, so you would have to, uh, to, to quantify the losses here between end energy and useful energy. Yeah? So the efficiency um, of end energy use is not accounted for. Yeah, so this is only the step between primary and end energy. Yeah, so please review the concept of primary and final energy. Uh, once again, primary energy is raw energy as we take it from nature. And final energy is what we pay for. And useful energy is what we make out of what we pay for.
Okay, good. So we should open the windows after, uh, after every 20 minutes for a brief, um, for two or three minutes, um, all of them. I did a little bit of research on that um, last weekend because I found a paper, uh, but I immediately also found a few mistakes uh, in that paper, and so I did uh, my, my own calculations. Um, and, well, maybe I give uh, once a small lecture on, um, on what one has to do in order to really reduce or to minimize the exposure to potential, well, virus loading aerosols here. Um, okay, I write down uh, the headline of the, of the next subject and then we close the windows again. Yeah, so uh, the point to make is that it's really much more useful to open the windows for two minutes or three minutes and close them afterwards than just leaving open one window all the time. Yeah? So it's more comfortable and it's more effective. Uh, interesting, interesting thing. Everybody says that, but nobody believes it, um, including me, uh, until I made uh, my, my own calculations. Taxonomy of renewables. So I think we can close the windows again. And then we start. So and please remind me after 20 minutes or so um, that we open windows again. So now, uh, as I discussed, Disregarding nuclear power, yeah, which we can produce artificially, of course, but which is also present naturally. So disregarding nuclear power and tidal power, all renewable energy is, is, comes from the sun, is solar power, yeah, directly or indirectly. So let's write that up. So disregarding Uh, geothermal heat and nuclear power yeah, both are the same as I said um, and tidal powers all renewable Um, energy sources are directly or indirectly powered by the sun. And of course you could also say that uh, also uh, the mineral, um, mineral oil and coal and so on uh, that they are also solar power, but uh, we want to discuss uh, here the taxonomy of renewables. So all renewable energy sources are directly or indirectly powered by the sun. Yeah? And globally relevant, globally relevant are direct solar radiation, also called insulation, wind. Yeah, so we learn that, uh, that the atmosphere is actually a heat engine, no, a very complicated heat engine. We have, um, also in the, uh, in, in, at the equator, uh, the temperatures are much higher than in the polar regions, yeah? and therefore there is um, circulation of air, uh, atmospheric uh, circulation, 
and this is wind, yeah? and it's powered directly by the sun. Wind, and we have biofuel. Yeah? And now you understand why, uh, why I want to discuss um, heat engines in the next chapter, yeah? because this produces the wind. Um, I have shown you um, a small graph here um, depicting all kinds of, um, of renewables and, and, and other energy, but um, the details uh, don't matter. Um, we are concerned only with the globally relevant ones. The next thing to discuss would be the power density that you can produce. Yeah? So, um, power density is, of course, kind of important because what you want to do um, is you want to collect uh, the renewables efficiently. And the higher the power density, um, the, um, the, the easier it is to do. Yeah? So, if we look for solar and if we look for the insulation, then we find that it's between 100 and 250 watts per square meter. Remember, we said that the solar constant is something like 1300 watts per square centimeter. About 30% of that is reflected directly, so it goes directly back to space. Um, about 1000 watts per square centimeter are absorbed. However, only the normal component. Yeah? So um, the solar constant um, considers, of course, uh, that you have a perpendicular incidence. Um, so you have to average over that, and then you have to average over day and night, summer and winter, and this then leads to 100 to 250 watts per square centimeter in the deserts closer to 250 watts per square centimeter, perhaps even a little bit higher. And uh, here in, in Germany, perhaps uh, something like 125 watts per, square, uh, watts per square meter. Watts per square meter. I said square centimeter, right? I'm spoiled from optics. Um, so watts per square meter. Um, and um, yeah. So, here, yeah, Germany, 125 watts per square meter, averaged over day and night, summer and winter. Now, assume that we have um, a solar cell with 20% efficiency. Yeah, so, in the summer term, we deduced the maximum efficiency that's possible by a photovoltaic cell the so-called Shockley-Kaiser limit. And what you find out is that the theoretical limit under certain assumptions is 30%. And what's realized nowadays is 20%. Yeah, so this is, um, this is um, meanwhile, pretty much a standard. Yeah, so, um, one of the books that I use for reference quite uh, frequently, and uh, I would um, I certainly recommend to you is this book by David McKay, um, Energy, I think it's called Energy or Renewable Energies Without the Hot Air. You can uh, download it free on the internet as a PDF. Yeah, so very nice. Um, and the claim he makes in this book, yeah, so there are many uh, correct things uh, in there, but uh, here is a counter example. The claim he makes is that he is pretty sure um, that, um, that the efficiency of solar cells, so of commercial solar cells, will not grow much above 10% because then it becomes too expensive. Yeah? So this is the same kind of mindset uh, that we saw uh, in this book that I, dis uh, that I discussed about, so the Brundle uh, book about, um, about fluid dynamics. Yeah? So there they also said, well, uh, the most important thing is low costs. But um, in technology, it's always the same thing. Yeah? Um, the, um, if, you put, um, if you put mental power 
into a product and make it better by that, then this is the cheapest way to save money and to make things more efficient. Yeah? Um, so, and um, again, yeah, so the efficiency, um, yeah, so unless there are hard technological and uh, or even physical limits, uh, the efficiency will go close to the, um, uh, to the theoretical limit. And well, 20% are not so far away from the 30%, at least if you compare it with the situation just 10 years or so ago, or perhaps 15 years ago, where the standard was a little bit above um, uh, 10%. So from this we get, we get an efficiency, or we get, um, we get perhaps an energy density of um, 25 watts per, square uh, watts per square meter. And well, then you don't cover the entire um, surface, yeah, but you have gaps between and so on and so forth. So um, realistic, I would say, is something on the order of 15 watts per square meter. Yeah? You also can't uh, cover the entire roof. Um, yeah, and uh, part of the roofs goes to the other direction, so 15%, perhaps 10% only. So that's solar. Now let's come to wind. And um, as an example, we use, we use the London Array. So this is what you see here, the London Array. So this is yeah, at the mouth of the Thames, uh, it's, a, it's a huge field of, um, of uh, wind power um, uh, turbines. Um, actually, how many are these? Yeah, so the total capacity is now 630 megawatts, and uh, they, are, they cover an area of, uh, of, 100, uh, of 100 kilometers squared. Yeah, so a huge uh, plant, and of course the distance between the windmills um, is adjusted such that, um, well, that there is no wind shadow from uh, one turbine to the next. Yeah? So in order to, to maximize the efficiency, and therefore you can take this an, as an example. So this, um, this uh, wind farm, you can take as an example to estimate the power density. Yeah? Um, there are actually larger uh, wind farms meanwhile. Um, actually also in Great Britain. They have good conditions for that around their island. Yes, thank you. So the London, the London array. Yeah, so the total capacity is The total capacity is 630 megawatts. This is just the total capacity. So this is a maximum output, uh, output power of that wind farm. But of course, uh, wind not always blows uh, such that 630 megawatts are produced. Um, but of course, uh, there is statistics um, on um, on, on, on the electricity produced, and the capacity factor, the capacity factor of that, what do you, what do you guess as a capacity factor? So how much of, uh, of the 630 megawatts is produced on average? What do you guess? Hmm? 300, so, uh, so you say 300, that would be half, 50% or so. Yeah? That's too optimistic. Um, well, uh, it's uh, 30, 39%, but it's not so uh, far away. So if you, if you look at the wind uh, power plants, um, so to the, to the, uh, to the, to the west of, of Jena, in Kopans, what do you think? The capacity factor is there. Twenty-eight percent. That's too optimistic. <laughs> so it's uh, it's around twenty percent, uh, depending on where it is. But it can also be below twenty percent. Yeah. So uh, onshore, 
uh, is yeah, so the wind is much less steady onshore. Yeah, so that's that's known. Yeah, so and if we calculate now the power ten density, then we find two and a half watts per square meter. Yeah, and onshore. Uh, yeah, so one watt per square meter is a good guess. Yeah. Of course, you always have to see how this, uh, what we mean by power density. Um, if you just mean the f 10 square meters on which the tower of the wind power uh, turbine stands, then of course the energy density is much, much higher, right? And for those who build it, this is of course the relevant, um, the relative, uh, the relevant figure. But um, if we speak about the potential of wind power, then the numbers that I just gave are uh, the relevant figures. So let's compare that to another famous renewable energy source, namely hydro energy, yeah, so water power. Um, and there, uh, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. And what I did was just to look on how much hydropower Germany and Norway produce. Yeah, so Norway is known for, uh, for, um, uh, for fulfilling their energy needs mainly by hydropower. In Germany, we don't have this, um, uh, this opportunity. First of all, we have less uh, water. And then uh, Germany is much, uh, has per area much more uh, energy consumption. So the energy density on the consumption. Stream beenden und neu starten? Nee. Ach so, in, ja. in OBS. Jetzt schaut es wieder gut aus. Also Stream beenden und neu starten. So, keine Daten, sehr gute Verbindung. Dann probieren wir es mal, oder? Simbit. Okay, dann machen wir mal weiter. Gut. Ja, also, tschüss. So, äh, machen wir zuerst das Fenster zu. So, we want to compare to hydropower. And I said that we compare just Norway and, and Germany. So if anybody has, has better figures, uh, please let me know. Yeah, or better ways to estimate the power ten density for, for hydropower. Yeah, so they uh, produce um, 140 terawatt hours per year. And this corresponds to, if I divide through 8,000 hours, yeah, so this is how long a year is, then we would get 16 gigawatt and the area of Norway is not much different from the one in Germany. It's close to 400,000 kilometers squared. And then you get 0 0.04 watts per square meter. Yeah? And then we have Germany. Um, we just have a third of that. And um, yeah. Germany is also a little bit smaller. But of course, this means that the power density from hydro power is smaller than in Norway. Yeah. This you need to contrast with the catching area or Einzugsgebiet. Yeah. And this is, um, and this goes interestingly just the other way around. So the catching area of a solar cell is just the solar cell. The catching area of, um, of a windmill 
is much greater. And even greater is the catching area of a, of a, of a hydropower plant. Yeah? So catching area. Um, yeah, so this is the footprint of the facility. Um, yeah, so what we uh, want to specify is the footprint of the facility versus the catching area. Catching area. Yeah, and for solar, uh, the ratio is approximately one. So the ratio is roughly one. Uh, for wind, well, it depends on how you define it. If you take the entire wind farm, or if you just take the footprint of, uh, of each of the windmills individually, yeah, after all, you can, you can perfectly do agriculture below the windmills. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is um, yeah, difficult to say. Yeah? And for hydro, it is much, much smaller than one. Right? And uh, here, somewhere in between. Yeah. Or in other words, hydro has a lot of hinterland, uh, wind also considerable, and uh, solar none. Okay, so this concludes now um, chapter um, chapter one, and we continue with chapter with chapter three. Chapter two will be next time, as I said. Yeah. And um, chapter three is headlined with endo-reversible heat engines. Last time I learned that some of you are not familiar with the canoe engine. Is this true? Canoe engine? Who knows about the canoe engine? Yeah. Yeah, last week uh, I mentioned it, right? Uh, Okay, I'm not sure whether I get the ping here. Probably not. Stream geht wieder, hat jemand geschrieben. Anyway, so I'll briefly also review the canoe engine. Yeah, so uh, just a very brief uh, review of the uh, canoe engine. But of course, the headline is endo reversible, endo reversible heat engines. So let's discuss the canoe engine. Ah, so canoe, this was a famous French engineer. And uh, the interesting thing is that he derived the physics um, of, an heat, of a heat engine without understanding it. It actually was not possible at his time to, um, to understand it because the concept of entropy, which is fundamental to the, um, to the can canoe engine, was only invented, yeah, I think more than 50 years later. Yeah, more than 50 years later. Um, so here is Cano. So let's see. No, I don't, I thought I have a picture of Cano. Unfortunately, I don't. Yeah. So at that time, um, at that time, people still had the, uh, or, or understood heat as a kind of fluid. Yeah, so they thought Lavoisier, also a famous French scientist, chemist, um, he considered 
um, heat is a kind of a fluid that is uh, in that is within uh, the objects, yeah? and you can put a little bit more or a little bit less. Yeah? And um, at Lavoisier's time, this was already so. This was the so-called caloric theory of of heat, and um, this was already questionable at his time. And uh, for example, uh, in in Munich. Uh, Count Rumford, um, who modernized the Bavarian king kingdom at that time um, and organized all kinds of things, um, but also the army. So he watched when they, when they drilled the cannons. Yeah? So they had a big piece of brass and they drilled the hole into it. Um, and uh, he, obs he observed that they can boil a lot of water and so he, uh, he concluded that there is an endless amount of, uh, of, this, of this heat fluid in there and concluded that this can't be the, uh, the case. Yeah? Um, but based on this wrong theory, um, Cano actually devised his, um, um, his concept of a heat engine and, and also derived the ultimate efficiency that a heat engine can have. So the, uh, the fundamental point is that there is no heat engine that can have an efficiency higher than the Carnot efficiency. Okay, so let's uh, look how uh, such a Carnot engine looks like um, schematically. Yeah? So what we have is are two temperatures, yeah? so a he two heat paths, a bath, uh, as we say, an upper one here, with a higher temperature and a lower one, right? And in between is the heat engine. So if you, if you think of a regular engine that you know from a car, um, what, is the upper, what is the upper level? Well, you burn fuel and it burns at a certain temperature. Um, and this temperature would kind of approximate uh, the upper heat bath. Right? And the lower one is, of course, the surrounding temperature or actually the temperature of the cooling water. Yeah? And what the machine does is that it uses some of the heat that flows from the upper um, heat bath uh, to the machine. Some of it is transformed into work and the rest is ejected. Yeah? And the essential point to realize is that it's not possible to convert all the heat into work. Yeah? Okay, well, let's write um, a few things. So the Carnot engine the Carnot engine is an idealized Heat engine that is reversible. Yeah, and you see um, this term here, reversible, is already is also in the headline, but here uh, it says endo-reversible. Yeah, kind of reversible, but not quite reversible. Um, so is reversible. What does this mean? What it means is that if you let run this machine for a while and produce some work, then after that period you can put in this work into the machine and it would transport then the heat or could transport the heat in the opposite direction such that the initial state is completely restored. That's reversible. Right? Most processes in nature are not really reversible yeah? because, well, because entropy is produced. So, uh, what is, let's write that up. So, you can run the machine 
for a while. And then use the generated work to restore the original state. Yeah? And the real heat engine is never entirely reversible. Yeah? So, um, reversible processes leave the entropy unchanged. And uh, of course I have to specify what entropy is. It's a fairly abstract physical quantity. Yeah? Um, what it is, yeah, so we call it S, and it is the ratio of the heat to the temperature. Yeah? So heat divided by absolute temperature, this by definition is the entropy. Yeah? Yeah, the entropy, yeah, so S by definition is Q divided by T, unchanged. So um, this means for the um, Carnot machine, for the Carnot machine, we have then two things, namely, of course, the first law, energy conservation, the first law of thermodynamics, which says, of course, that the work generated, yeah, so the joules generated as work, can only be the difference of the joules between Q1 and Q2. Yeah, so um, the work is equal to Q, the difference of Q1 and Q2. Yeah, that's the easy thing, but actually the other thing is also not more difficult because we said it, reversible processes, and the Carnot machine is reversible, leave the entropy unchanged, which means that Q1 divided by T1 is equal to Q2 divided by T2. Now, if the machine is not reversible, then the entropy, um, um, the entropy after one cycle of the machine is, uh, is larger. This would mean that, um, that the entropy here, so this entropy here, S2, would be larger than S1. Yeah. And um, well, let's let's look at uh, the definition for a while, yeah, so that it um, um, that it becomes perhaps a little bit more clear. So um, you see that low entropy is kind of good. Yeah, and what you also see then, so if you if you accept that, is that if you have high temperature. Then, for a given heat, you have low entropy. Yeah, so, high temperature is a high quality energy source because it has low entropy. Yeah, low temperatures is not worth much. Okay, so, in this we use. So these two um, laws we use in order to calculate the maximum possible efficiency. And uh, this, um, this is actually one of the most profound insights of physics, as simple as it, as it is. So the efficiency we define as the work that we generate divided by Q1. Right? So this is what you would naturally do. Yeah, you pay for uh, the gas or for the, for, the, for the oil, and what you produce is work. Right? Therefore, this is a natural definition. Now, uh, we substitute uh, the first law, and there we have Q1 
minus Q2 divided by Q1. And this we can simplify a little bit so that we have 1 minus Q2 over Q1. And now um, we plug in the second law. Yeah? So we plug in the second law. Here we plugged in the first law. And uh, then we see that we get 1 minus, ah yeah, I wrote it wrote incorrectly here, 1 minus T2 over T1. Absolute temperature, of course, as usual. Yeah? And uh, this is a really important law. Therefore, it's probably appropriate to to frame it, yeah, as I said, one of the most important concepts, this canoe engine, yeah, so you can build up a um, large part of thermodynamics um, based on the canoe um, efficiency. Yeah? And more than the canoe efficiency is not possible. There is no heat engine that can beat this fundamental limit. So this is the canoe engine. This is a reversible engine. Now what is an endoreversible engine? An endoreversible heat engine is a, is a heat engine that is of course not reversible, at least not entirely reversible, but um, it is a heat engine where I can at least well, describe the core of the engine as, as reversible. Yeah? Um, let's write that up and uh, see whether we can make this clearer subsequently. So the definition of an endoreversible heat engine. Endoreversible heat engines I will use the abbreviation WKM. It stands for Wärmekraftmaschinen. Yeah? So they are irreversible heat engines. By the way, it's very complicated to deal with irreversible heat engines. Yeah, reversible, this is fairly simple physics. Irreversible processes are complicated, but this one, this endoreversible heat engine, is so yeah, a little bit uh, at the border of both, so it's still tractable. So these are irreversible um, heat engines. Um, however, all the irreversibilities, they are just due to the coupling of the machine to the surrounding. Yeah, so if you look at this here, um, we have here perfect coupling of the heat bars to the machine. Now, if you think of a power plant, for example, so there you have the generator, and the generator would be this thing here. Yeah? And you have the upper heat bars. If it's a nuclear power plant, then uh, this here would be uh, the nuclear, the nuclear fuel would be here. Yeah? But then uh, you don't couple them directly, but you have heat exchangers in between. And the heat exchangers, well, they're not perfect. They can't be perfect. Yeah? So they, you can describe them kind as, um, well, as ohmic resistors in some sense. Yeah? When you take the temperature difference, uh, make the analogy to, to electric potential difference, right? you can describe it in the same with the same mass. Yeah? So this is the Fourier heat diffusion law that's behind that. Um, so there will be, there's heat conduction in between, and we'll see that heat conduction, of course, produces entropy. We'll see this in a minute, but actually it should be, should already be clear if you think about it. Okay, so our irreversible heat engines were um, well, that's important what I forget, forgot, where all
Um, irreversibilities are due to the coupling of the machine to the external world. Well, and what I mean is the heat, ba heat bath. Yeah. In other words, yeah, what this means is that the core of the endoreversible heat engine is actually a canoe machine, a reversible heat engine. Yeah. Um, in other words, the core of the machine is supposed to be Um, reversible, in other words, a canoe machine. A reversible WKM, yeah, heat engine. Um, which means that it has canoe efficiency. So this part has canoe efficiency. Yeah. And this explains actually the name, because endo is, is Greek, and it means internal. Yeah. This explains the, the name um, endo is Greek for internal. And yeah, so you might expect that this kind of this kind of physics is quite old, but it's actually not so old. It's uh, just forty years or so. Uh, so the concept is quite recent. Um, this definition goes back actually to um, now fifty years ago. Yeah, so nineteen seventy-nine, or perhaps yeah, close. Yeah, fifty. Actually, just 40 years ago. This is an ETA, yeah? Uh, you are right, so I should look that up. Yeah, let's look it up, yeah? So did you have Greek at home, uh, in, at, at school? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I will look it up. So the question was whether I wrote this correctly. The question was that there should be a nu instead of an eta. And uh, I think th this makes sense, yeah? Uh, so let's check it. Um, so, a historical note, yeah, so the concept. is quite recent, so you may, may feel differently. Yeah, so it's younger than me, so I think it's recent, um, and you probably think differently. Um, yeah, so there is a paper by Rubin in Physical Review, A, Physical Review A, Volume 19, um, 1272, and this was from 1979. 
And uh, the particular machine that we discuss is, um, is the curzon albon machine. So we will discuss a specific version. The curzon albon machine. And the paper is in American Journal of Physics. And actually, I forgot to write down the year when this was, when this was published. Yeah, so the American Journal of Physics, this is, a, um, this is an educational journal, uh, however, of a very high quality. It's not so easy to to publish there. So now let's look at this Curzon Albon machine. Uh, the stream uh, again has a problem. Let's open the window for a minute. I don't think that it helps the stream. Sorry? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be pseudoscience, yeah. <laughs> so I write down uh, the, uh, the next headline, and then we close the windows again. Sorry, one, the Curzon Albon machine. The Curzon Albon machine. Good, and perhaps also the a sketch of this machine. But then we'll close the windows again. Pseudoscience works, yeah. Okay, let's close the windows again. <laughs> also, it's likely that the stream breaks down again. So, now look uh, what we have. This is the Curzon Albon machine. And uh, what we have now is, so this inner part here is the same thing as what we had here, right? So we assume that this machine here is reversible, that this is a canoe engine. But what we have here is that, um, that we have a heat exchanger or something like that, a thermal resistor, you could say. And uh, this means that the upper heat bath that's relevant for uh, the canoe machine is this level T3. Right? And on the cold side, the same thing. And now you see immediately how this machine produces entropy. Yeah? So if you look here, um, we have here the temperature T1, which is high, which means that for the given heat, Q1, the entropy is low because the denominator is large. Right? Here, we have the same heat, of course, yeah, so the same number of joules, but it's now at a lower temperature. So what you see is that the entropy is produced, entropy is produced here. And of course, also entropy will be produced here. Yeah, so from the definition of, from the definition of the entropy, you see immediately that heat conduction automatically produces entropy. Yeah? Okay, let's write a few things about it. So, 
So the diagram, the diagram of the Curzon Albon machine shows a reversible um, heat engine, WKM, coupled to the surrounding or to the environment, uh, better to the heat bath. via um, yeah, a thermal resistor or heat conduction. Yeah, so this is heat conduction. Yeah. Um, so the heat resistors or the thermal resistors produce entropy. As evident from the definition, as evident from the definition of entropy. And what we assume is that we have linear, a linear heat conductor, so similar to, um, similar to an ohmic resistor. So um, a linear heat conductor described by Fourier's heat diffusion law. Yeah, so linear heat conductor. So this means um, that the Fourier heat diffusion law is applicable. Yeah, this means that Q is equal to minus lambda, some constant, times the gradient um, of temperature. So that's equation one. And in 1D, and we'll use it in 1D, this reduces to something that's similar of Ohm's law. Yeah? In 1D, this reduces to a law or equivalent, I should say, not just similar. To Ohm's law. Yeah. And um, this means that we can write that Q1 is equal to some heat, con um, yeah, so some heat contact conductance, yeah, so the inverse of the resistance, um, where we use the temperature difference. Yeah, so you see here that we have the temperature T1 and T3. So uh, T1 minus T3 is the temperature difference, and um, well, the heat is proportional to that, and the proportionality constant is G1. Uh, what are the of the That's difficult to read. Okay, uh, should have made it larger. Um, so the 
question is, uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's too small. Yeah, so this is T3, this is T4, and this is T2. And Q2 is equal to G2 and T4 minus T2. Now that's equation two and three. So a side remark, a historic side remark. Um, Fourier, the question Fourier was interested in when he developed the theory of Fourier analysis was the question why the Earth has the temperature that it has. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, and his speculation was, uh, so he had different um, hypotheses about that. Uh, and uh, one was, of course, that the heat, um, that the heat comes from the, from the inside of the Earth. Uh, and he used, um, and he developed the mass, um, and uh, Fourier analysis is part of that. He developed the mass in order to solve that problem and found out, no, this can't be the case. Uh, strangely enough, he uh, never concluded that, um, that it's from the sun that we receive most of our energy. The speculation even was that it's from the stars. Uh, so uh, very strange to us. Um, I'm not quite sure, uh, yeah, so I didn't uh, study uh, history of, um, of science uh, so much that I could answer why he came or why he considered this reasonable. Yeah? But Fourier analysis comes actually from the problem we are concerned with and that we'll discuss next time. Yeah? So we'll develop formulas next time where we can actually predict the temperature um, of Earth. Okay, yeah, so um, let's make a remark concerning uh, these proportionality constants. Yeah, so G1 and G2 are conductances. So the inverse of resistances. The inverse of resistances. Yeah, so you could write something like one over G1 is one over R1. Yeah, so next we start to develop some, um, we start to develop some, um, yeah, some mass around it. And the first thing to note is, of course, as yeah, so we start with the very fact um, that we made it up such that the inner part, yeah, or rather this part, is a reversible, is a reversible heat engine. And therefore, we can write down immediately the efficiency. The efficiency is the Carnot efficiency. Yeah? So, um, since um, the engine itself is a Carnot engine, Um, we have that the efficiency is given by the work divided by Q, that's just the definition, Q1 of course, and this is 1 minus T4 over T3, right? So if you look at this, yeah, so the lower heat bars is T, T4, and the upper heat bars that's coupled to the machine, directly coupled to the machine, is T3. Yep, so that's, uh, that is clear by how we defined our problem. So that's equation four. Now, um, we have 
we have, of course, the first law. Yeah, so we use the first law, which is energy conservation. Um, of course, the first law holds And this means that Q1 is equal to the work plus Q2. Yeah. And um, in addition, we have uh, the we have conservation of entropy uh, at least between T3 and T4. Yeah. In addition. Um, conservation of entropy between just only between T3 and T4. And this means that the ratio of Q and T is constant. So Q1 divided by T1 is equal, no T3 of course, is equal to Q2 divided by T4. Yeah, we substitute um, equation, um, these equations, yeah, so these equations here, two and three, yeah, we substitute them into uh, into the conservation of, of entropy, and um, we get so five, um, two, and three in equation six, and then we get that G one. Times T1 minus T3 divided by T3 is equal to G2 times T4 minus T2 over T4. That's equation 7. So, now um, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of variables. Yeah, so, if you look at, we have a lot of temperatures. We have now four temperatures, and um, the question is how to, ter to determine uh, them. So, what's probably known is, or what should be known, is of course the temperature T1 and the temperature T2. But we don't know these temperatures. And therefore, it's difficult to, or impossible to, to do anything. Yeah? Um, and so the question is, um, well, and so we can consider the situation that we have, namely um, this equation here and, and this equation, we can consider as a set of, so this is a system of two equations, yeah, and we can start out to solve it. And this is basically what we do. Um, and the next thing will be that, um, uh, which sounds at first, glance a little bit strange, what we'll do is to use the efficiency as an independent variable. So what we will say, what we will uh, try to find out is how the, the work depends on the efficiency. Sounds a little bit stupid, but if you think about it, it's not stupid at all, because what do you want from a heat engine? You want work. Yeah, so because work is equal to dollars. Yeah, so this earns you the money. And Q1 is what you put in. This is what costs money. Right? And um, therefore, the question, is, um, the question is whether it's really reasonable to, um, to, to try to um, realize maximum efficiency. Now, what you want in the end is maximum, um, maximum work out at lowest cost. 
Huh? Now you could say, well, uh, for example, um, if it will turn out that if we use the Carnot efficiency, yeah, so if we want to achieve Carnot efficiency for this irreversible machine, then this can only be achieved if the work goes to zero, right? And then the machine is not very use, uh, useful. Yeah? Um, and so we need to find a compromise. Yeah? So if we run the machine where it's very inefficient, but a lot of work comes out, it may also cost a lot. Yeah? So uh, we need to find the optimum. And this is basically the, the job that we want to do. And we'll find a remarkable simple formula for that. And um, alone for that, it's worth the effort. Yeah? So it will take a few lines and uh, a little bit lengthy discussion to do that. And we'll do this in two weeks, because next week we have, um, well, I actually hope that you enjoy uh, the next lecture, because it's, uh, it's kind of cute how, uh, how one can calculate and predict um, the temperature of Earth. So see you next, next week. Hope a few come. Um, stay, stay, stay at good house. Thank you. Yeah, just leave it here. <laughs>